My name is Matthew Gar Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matthew Garcia, and I have the honor of introducing former Chief of Staff of the Army, General Peter Schoomaker. Peter J. Schoomaker was the 35th Chief of Staff of the United States Army, serving in that position from 2003 to 2007. General Schoomaker served for 31 years in a variety of command and staff assignments with both conventional and special operations forces. During his distinguished career, he served as Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Special Operations Command, Commander, Commanding General, U.S. Army Special Operations Command, Commanding General, Joint Special Operations Command. General Schoomaker's appointment as Army Chief of Staff was unique in that he was recalled from retirement to serve in that position. General Schoomaker is the first Special Forces trained Army Chief of Staff and the second to serve on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's a graduate of the National War College and holds a Master of Arts degree in Management from Central Michigan University. Ladies and gentlemen, the 35th Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General Peter Schoomaker. Oh, well, well, my bad. That's all right. <laughs> Where you want me to go? Take your speech. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Taylor Martinson. I am the, have the honor of introducing former Chief of Staff of the Army, General George W. Casey. General Casey was the 36th Chief of Staff of the United States Army, serving in the position from 2007 to 2011. Commissioned as an infantry officer in 1970, General Casey served for more than 41 years in the United States Army. He served in key positions, which included Commander, 3rd Brigade, 1st Cavalry Division, Assistant Division Commander Maneuver, and Assistant Division Commander Support for the 1st Armored Division. Director of Strategic Plans and Policies of the Joint Staff and sequentially as Director of the Joint Staff. He also served as the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army and then served as the Commander, Multinational Force Iraq until his nomination as Chief of Staff of the Army. General Casey holds a Master of Arts degree in International Relations from the University of Denver. Ladies and gentlemen, the 36th Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General W. Casey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, Colonel Andy Morgado, Commander of 3rd Brigade Cadet Command, and it is a distinct honor and privilege uh, for me to serve uh, as a moderator uh, for this afternoon's panel. Uh, these two gentlemen are extremely influential leaders uh, and leaders and agents of change. Uh, they helped lead our Army uh, from an Army that was prepared for one type of warfare and are still leading it into the future. As we are in an army in a period of uncertainty and change now, I can think of no uh, two better leaders uh, to assist us or to provide insights uh, into our army of the future that all of us will continue to march into, particularly our cadets that are seated here with us. So gentlemen, as uh, the moderator uh, in such a distinguished panel, I intend to do as little work as possible uh, and just allow you uh, to engage our cadets. And I, I will see simply- see things haven't changed for colonels. <laughs> <laughs> So my main job will, <laughs> uh, sorry, I will not hide my face as I receive my paycheck. Uh, but uh, I'll help to keep the conversation moving. Uh, I'll certainly uh, ask the first question, uh, but I would ask uh, General Schumacher if you'd like to share any opening comments uh, with us before we begin. Well, I, uh, we were talking coming up here uh, from the airport about uh, how much fun it is to come back to Leavenworth, both of us. Uh, we're here as kids because our our uh, fathers were in the in the army, and uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, uh, you don't you don't know this, but there used to be another building called Bell Hall that was built in 1958, and that uh, that was where all of this took place up until this building being built in 2007. So it's a, it's a lot of fun to come back. I actually started my ROTC. Uh, experience in high school here at Leavenworth. This is where I went to high school. And uh, in those days, the ROTC was mandatory at Leavenworth High School. So I go back a little bit, uh, you know. I think, uh, what would that be, George? We're not counting. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a long time ago, but um, you know, it's a, it's a great program and it's a real uh, privilege to be with you here today and I, I hope we'll have a good, uh, a good conversation. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, General Casey. Great. Uh, wonderful to be around young folks. I uh, 
I, I teach leadership in the business school at Cornell, and I teach international relations at University of Denver. And so I'm out on college campuses around the country, and it's, uh, it's great seeing the next generation coming forward. Now, I know you're probably looking at us two old guys up here and saying, wow, what's it like going from running an army of a million people to being an army of one? Because that's kind of what we are right now. And, and I'll tell you, right before Thanksgiving last year, I, 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 was, I was having difficulty describing it to people, but I, right before Thanksgiving, I was doing a crossword puzzle. And the clue was army head, seven letters. It says easy, general, boom, move on. So you know how when you're doing a crossword puzzle, you realize something's not working? So I kept going back and kept going back, and I finally realized it wasn't army head, it was army head, and the answer was latrine. <laughs> and that kind of helped put it in perspective for me about what it was like going from running a million people <laughs> down to down to being an army of one. Um, I, I do a lot of work still at Georgetown, which is my alma mater, which is where I graduated from ROTC in 1970. It, it was a tough period yeah, from 1966 to 70. We started out with about, with several hundred people. It was a battalion size. We finished up with less than 104 years later. That was during the Vietnam War and wearing the uniform around campus uh, wasn't very pretty. But it still gave us the foundation that we needed to become effective leaders uh, in our army. And I think Pete and I both would tell you, we, we built on that foundation uh, over the years. You um, know, uh, I went to Wyoming, and we were still in America during that <laughs> period. We didn't have that kind of a problem yeah, out there. A little different out there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the bottom line is the foundation you get uh, we'll stand you in good stead as you go forward, and who knows, you could be whatever you, whatever you think you could be. Well, sir, well, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, gentlemen, I'd like to begin uh, with one question, and I'm sure uh, once I get the ball rolling, our cadets are eager, uh, and we'll have some, some great questions for us. Uh, but I'd like to begin with the idea of adaptive and agile. Uh, those are two words uh, used as adjectives to describe what modern leaders should be. Uh, but I would argue, uh, as young cadets and even old, old colonels like myself, we struggle with the action words. Uh, how do we get at change? How do we facilitate change? And how do we get the ball rolling? So any thoughts about young leaders and what those action words or verbs might be to influence change? There you go. Yeah. So uh, shortly after I, I had retired, I got a call from the dean of the Keenan Flagler Business School at University of North Carolina. And she said, General, will you please come and talk to our executive MBA program about leading in a VUCA world? And I said, sure, Dean, no problem. And I hung up and I Googled VUCA immediately. <laughs> and imagine my surprise when I found out that it was a term coined by the Army War College in the late 80s, early 90s to describe what they thought the world would look like in the aftermath of the Soviet Union. Volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And as I was preparing for that, I, I realized that I'd seen VUCA in Bosnia, I'd seen it in Kosovo, I'd seen it in spades in Iraq, and I'd seen it in, in spades in the Pentagon where the insurgents and the terrorists wore suits. <laughs> but that, that's your world. And when I talk to business audiences and, and I talk about VUCA, they, it resonates with them. And that's the world that you will live in. Things will change, they'll change quickly, they'll change for reasons beyond your control. You, you, when you start something, you'll, you'll never be sure of accomplishing the outcome. Things are, are more and more complex because you have to integrate multiple and sometimes competing variables. And huge ambiguity out there because you can draw all sorts of conclusions from the same data. And that's why you have to have an agile mind and you have to be willing to adapt, to lead. But in the end, you have to act. And that takes courage. I agree with all of that. The, uh, you know, the world I grew up in in the military. Well, let me start out. I played football in college. How many people here played sports? Raise your hand up. See, you all, you all play sports. And how many of you have been on the field, of any field, and uh, you know you've got a master game plan. You've got a great 
playbook and all the rest of this stuff. And uh, you get out there, and for some reason, uh, you know, things are a little bit different when you get out on the field of what you thought they were going to look like on the chalkboard, right? And I use that to explain to people sometimes how important it is. You know, Eisenhower said, you know, I think it was Eisenhower that said something about the, most, the, the plan's not as important as the process of right. planning. Right. You know, it's the idea of, of going through the thinking because it brings everybody together in context and, and gives you a common baseline. And so when I think about agile, I think about football, okay? Because you gotta be agile on the football field to get your clock clean, and you're not gonna win if you're not agile. And I played defense, and uh, we had a, a hell of a defense, and played in several, several bowl games, and, and had a very good team. But the reason we had a great team wasn't because of what was on the board, it wasn't because of what was in the playbook, it was because when, when the ball got snapped, and everything went to hell in a handbasket, good people made decisions in the moment to take advantage of, to make the play. You know, every play in football, if it went exactly like it's supposed to, would be a touchdown, right? And, and few of them are. And it's because you're up against a thinking enemy and we're up against a world that, that has a mind of its own and thinks. So I can tell you, George, you know, I grew up in special forces and special operations. George spent some time there too, and he's very, uh, you know, we were in the first cab together and a bunch of other places that, um, you know, we've been through this thing from beginning to end and planning and, you know, rehearsals and all the rock drills and all this kind of that gum stuff. But the fact of the matter is life and leadership is not a parade, okay? It is about being self-aware. It's about having an idea of what the context of, uh, of, of what's happening, you know, what's supposed to happen is, and about uh, developing, uh, uh, you know, the agility makes a lot of sense to me, being adaptive to take advantage of opportunity that, uh, that you see as you go through there. So I guess that's kind of how I would. As, as I recall, there was an Orange Bowl victory for that Wyoming team, wasn't there? No, we, we beat Florida State in the, in the Sun Bowl, Sun 66, Bowl. 28, 20, but we lost to LSU in the Sugar Bowl in, the, in 68. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like, I, I look at that Sugar Bowl kind of like I look at Desert One, you know, I was, you know, involved in Desert One, and, and to me, um, you know, that was a very successful failure. And what, uh, what losing a game like a Sugar Bowl, especially as close as we lost it, it's kind of like, you know, the Desert One thing. You, you know, you don't kind of put that in your pocket and walk away from it. You go back and you, you, uh, you really go through, uh, you know, modifications and take advantage of, you know, the after action review type of a, of a thing. And you change as, as a result of that so that, you, you know, that's part of the adaptation as well. So, these are, you know, all of you out there, who decide, well, it doesn't matter whether you come in the military or not, you know, in life, you're gonna run up against some hard things. You're gonna have failures, you're gonna have setbacks, you're gonna have successes. And all of them, uh, you know, all of them have uh, their challenges and how to deal with them. Even success uh, requires, uh, is a challenge to deal with it properly. Um, and so, I, uh, I'd, I'd be careful about thinking in too straight a line on things because that's not how life's going to be issued to you. Uh, and we're facing, uh, we're facing a world today that uh, um, is very, very, very dangerous. Yeah, one of the things I, I try to leave with the students, especially in the leadership course at Cornell, and these are second year MBA students, but, but so many young people think that people just go to the top uh, at, on a straight line that they never, there's no bumps in the road, there's no failures, there's no setbacks, it's all easy. It ain't easy. And it, anybody that who, who has succeeded and got to the top of their organization has, has setbacks along the way. And they not only have overcome those setbacks, they've gotten better as a result of encountering them and it's made them better at what they were doing. Uh, gentlemen, I find it uh, fascinating that both of you have used the term failure uh, in your, your description of, of how, how life may be. Would you be willing to share with us maybe one instance in your career where you experienced a significant setback or setback of some, some sort 
and uh, General Casey used the word courage uh, to help overcome that. Uh, any examples of that uh, you'd be willing to share with, with our cadets? Sure. I mean, I was, I was smoking along uh, up through lieutenant colonel, had, went through battalion command off to the uh, fellowship instead of going to the war college. I thought I was smoking hot. And all of a sudden, the brigade, brigade command list comes out, and I'm not on it. I said, well, just a minor oversight. I'm sure they'll correct it. And <laughs> next one comes out, and I'm not on it. And I'm thinking, hoo-hoo. I mean, and you all can look at the, at the statistics, but getting picked up the third time for brigade command is <laughs> not, a, not a, a chance that you want to take. So, any, but, so I'm saying, this, this is it. I'm kind of done here. And I, could, I didn't know why, but I came to, came, came to grips with it. And I was working in the Pentagon. I was working for the Army Chief of Staff, and he, had, he was leaving. So I was in this kind of nebulous period where I didn't really have a job. And I had accepted a job in the, in the Secretary of Defense's office working conventional forces and arms control. Now, the folks over here that know the Pentagon understand that back-to-back assignments in the Pentagon for a colonel means you're never leaving the Pentagon. And so I was pretty much done. I had enrolled in a uh, uh, executive MBA program at George Washington. I mean, I was, I was pretty much done. And then out of the blue, I get a call from uh, the commanding general of the 1st Cavalry Division, John Torelli, who I had never met. And he said, would, would you like to be considered to be my chief of staff? Now, this is a division my, my father was commanding in Vietnam when he was killed, and he had been the chief of staff of the division. So there was a lot of personal uh, emotion with that. And I said, sure, I would love to do that. So he said, well, come have an interview. So actually, I flew out, and I met him here at the Fort Leavenworth. He was going through a, a, a war game. And I had a 20-minute interview with him. And again, I never met him until that 20-minute interview. And I went back and to Washington, and days passed, weeks passed. Didn't hear anything. About a month passed. I called the chief of staff. Said, "Hey, how we doing?" You know, well, we haven't decided yet. And then about two months later, I get a call out of the blue and says, "When can you be here?" And so I packed up and went off to Fort Hood. Became the chief of staff of the First Cavalry Division, where I served there for 20 months. Imagine that. Came out on a brigade command list. Went off to Germany to be the Fifth Corps G3 and was a brigadier general a year after I left brigade command. And I could have been sitting doing an ex executive MBA program. Just happened. So you're, as I said, nothing goes in a straight line and nothing's easy. Um, and people always ask me what, what they should do. I said, find something. I say, find something you really like to do and be really good at it. You know, I, George and I served together in the 1st Cavalry Division right after this thing he's talking about right there. And uh, he was the chief of staff when I came in as ADC. And, uh, and then subsequently went to uh, Commander's 3rd Brigade very, very well. Um, don't take this the wrong way here, but I'm going to admit to you, I'm full of failures, okay, a bunch of them. And, uh, I also am not a guy that ever thought about being a general, nor did I ever think about I was going to have an Army career. In fact, I was getting out of the Army in 1977, 76, uh, right after I was with the Marines for a year at Amphibious Warfare School. And uh, a guy by the name of, uh, um, remember Bull Simons from Sante Raid? His deputy, I worked for him. And, he, uh, he convinced me to go down to Fort Bragg and get involved in some stuff down there. So I did. Ended up liking it and uh, kind of sticking with it. But I never was invited to go to the Pentagon until I was a one star. And I did 11 months and 19 days in that place. And uh, <laughs> got. That's got the told, nicest thing he's ever said about the Pentagon. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a cow pie, you know. It's. Uh, <laughs> A lot of flies hanging around. It. There's a reason. <laughs> but the um, but I went from there to, down to, to JSOC, and uh, of course, you know, I ended up getting promoted and everything, and commanded uh, U.S. Special Operations Command, uh, 
got extended there, and then I just, you know, retired. And uh, went back into ranching and doing the things that I like to do, and I was riding around my pickup truck when uh, I got this call. I just left my buddy. In fact, the buddy I left, he and I both know him, Bill Garrison. Bill Garrison commanded, uh, you know, the Black Hawk Down stuff. He, he was the guy Sam Shepard was playing on that picture show. And uh, we were together on some ranch deals, and uh, I was in my truck with my daughter, and we were buying a big place up in Wyoming, about 27,000 acres, and I get this dad Jim call that's from, somebody said he's from Rumsfeld's office, and so, you know, I used the F word on him because I thought it was Garrison, and hung up. And uh, of course, they called back, said this isn't a joke, and uh, you know they, they, he wants to talk to you, you know. And so anyway, it it kind of got into a tussle there, and so I, I anyway I had to go back to Washington to talk to them anyway. And uh, the big mistake I made, uh, at least I felt it was at the time, was not saying no hard enough uh, about getting called back as the chief of staff of the army. Uh, I found now I do not consider it to have been a mistake, but at the time I thought it was, and uh, I thought it was, uh, you know, that I wasn't the right person to do that. But there are there are things as you go through, you know. I'm always a little bit suspicious of somebody that's too ambitious, you know, that that kind of sees the goal line and you know and all that. Now I know there's a lot of people tell you you got to pl you got to plan your life and all that stuff. But I'm afraid sometimes that people, when they plan their life too hard, fail to see some interesting intersections where they have some choices to make. And some of those choices are really good choices, that if uh, you're blinded, you know, by certain things, um, you miss out. I was fortunate enough to have kind of wandered around through the pasture of life and crossed a couple places and lucked out. Uh, the wind blew the right direction, I went the right place, and you know, and I had a hell of a good time. I mean, I did. Yeah, bounced off the ground a bunch making parachute jumps, and we got in a lot of weird damn kind of situations. But I really liked it, you know, I really did. And I don't think had I really figured all that out, you know, you know, then, then I would have had quite, quite a good a time. So I, I guess, I don't mean to be wondering as much as you might think I am, but I think you gotta be careful on what mistakes are. You know, there's a lot of opportunity in mistakes, a lot. And if you've got, if, you're, if you think you're walking a balance beam to the stars, you're kidding yourself. You're just kidding yourself. It's a wonderful career. You're gonna be with wonderful people. Um, you'll have some wonderful opportunities. Uh, there will be some heartbreak involved in it, but in the end, I think what's important is you've got to, regardless of how many stars or whatever you end up with on your shoulder, you've got to be able to turn around and, and say, you know, that was really worth it, all that stuff. I think that's really important. So, anyway. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, I'd like to now turn it over to our cadets to see what questions do we have. Looks like paddle two. Gentlemen, how are y'all doing today? My Great. name is Cadet Johnson from the University of South Carolina. My question is, we kind of hear a lot of times about the old army versus the new army, that sort of thing, you know. You that one. And um, my question is kind of, how have you seen the army's change socially over time, and where do you see it headed? What trajectory do you see it following? You know, there's an old saying. There's a fellow by the name of Dick Meadows, who may be the finest soldier that ever wore jump boots. Um, he used to say, you know, the Army ain't like it used to be and it never was. Mm. And you got to think about that just a little bit. You know, you, a lot of people sitting around talking about how great yesterday was and everything like that. Let me tell you something. The Army that he and I joined was on its butt following Vietnam. Special Forces was in the dirt. The Army was falling apart. We were still a draft Army at the time. We had not converted to a professional force. When I came out of Airborne Ranger School, went to my first job as a recon platoon leader heading to Vietnam with the 4th Division. I was an infantry battalion, and uh, there were only two regular Army officers in my battalion. The, the S3, Battalion Operation Officer, and me, Second Lieutenant. Everybody else, OCS, had been drafted, gone to OCS, and were, you know, they were on a two-year deal. Their horizon was two years. And 
we got busloads of soldiers out of Fort Polk when we formed that battalion. And I don't know how many have ever heard of McNamara's 100,000. Well, we got our share of them. This is when they lowered the, the uh, GT standard to below 70, right? Yeah. Something like that. And uh, they, these people, uh, they were very good people in the main, but boy, did it take a long time to teach them something. But once you taught them something, they, they remembered it, you know. But it was not the Army that, that you're fixing to join. It was, uh, it was rough go. We had racial problems. We had drug problems. We had readiness problems. We had equipment problems. I remember being in Korea as Battalion S3. In fact, Colin Powell was Battalion Commander right there in the same brigade with him. I was Battalion S3. Yeah, we had enough fuel in Korea. This is 1974 when we found the tunnels, the first ones. They thought the North was coming June of 75, which would have been the 25th anniversary. We had enough fuel to go 50 miles a month with our battalion. And we had to use that same fuel to heat ourselves in the winter on the deal. We did a whole tank gunnery on five tanks. We had to change track. We had to change sprockets. We had to change gun tubes because we didn't have what we needed. I can't tell you how rough uh, that was and what the leadership challenges were in those days. That is not the Army you're joining today. The Army you're joining today has got its challenges. There's no question about it, but it is, it is an Army that's so much more professional, so much more ready than, than anything we ever saw in our time. That, uh, uh, so anyway. Yeah, uh, si similar experiences, first assignment in Germany. Uh, when you were a duty officer, you carried a loaded weapon. Uh, because of what you could encounter walking just around the, uh, the battalion area. There was so much of drugs and, and alcohol and, uh, in the barracks that you'd, if you found soldiers with, with drugs, you'd take the, the door off their room. And so people could come and go. Then they'd, then they'd put their wall lockers in front of the door so you couldn't see them. It was, it was just awful. And we had all these draftees who had come in and, and gone to basic training right over to Vietnam, had about six months left in the military, and they sent them to Germany. And they had drug problems, and they had alcohol problems, and they had post-traumatic stress, which we had no idea that, that that's what, what their challenges were at the time. We looked just at the drug or the alcohol problem. And, and it wasn't until, and, and then we get into the 70s, and we start implementing the, the, the volunteer army, which is what, where McNamara's 100,000 came from. Uh, but we didn't, as an army, we didn't set the pay scale high enough to attract people that wanted to be in the army the kind of people that we needed. And it really took us until the early 80s till we started coming around and getting our act together. And, and the best thing that happened during the 70s was an effort to rebuild the non-commissioned officer corps. And, and that, to me, is what has made the most substantial difference in the Army today. As I traveled around the world and visited my, uh, my foreign counterparts, and say, anything I can help you with? They say, yes, we want your non-commissioned officer corps. And, and that really came on strong in the, in the early eight to mid 80s, uh, and it kept us moving in, in the positive direction. Uh, the army that I saw in Iraq and that I led in uh, as the Army Chief of Staff was a, a magnificent force, still is, but a combat season force of, of great young leaders. As Pete said, do they have problems. You don't, you don't have an organization of a million people that doesn't have some problems. But this is a magnificent force, and it's a f magnificent force because of the people, the non-commissioned officers and the officers that lead it. Gentlemen, thank you. Do we have uh, another question? Okay, we have paddle two. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Cadet Frederick from Georgia Military College. Uh, as the Army Chief of Staff, what were some of your greatest challenges? Here you go. Well, you want to go ahead. The, uh, I, I think the, the biggest, you know, I, I, I always try to focus on what's the most important thing I have to do as a, a leader to be successful. So I spent a lot of time when I got to the job as the chief 
I actually spent about six months from the time I left Iraq in about four months into my tenure going all around mm -hmm. the Army trying to get it in my head what was the biggest challenges facing the Army. And, and what I saw as I went around in that four months was an Army that was, was stretched. And we'd been at war at the time for six years. Yeah, we, we'd, we'd lost about uh, 3,000 men and women. They'd left about 10,000 surviving family members. We, we had about 25,000 men and women wounded about 8,000 seriously enough to require long-term care. And we were just beginning to come to grips with post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain, traumatic brain injury and their impacts on the force. And, and as I looked at that, and I tried to figure out w what is the most important thing I can do as the chief of staff. And I realized that it was, it was to get the resources that we needed uh, to organize, train, and equip the force uh, so that we could sustain it and continue our transformation uh, away from being a conventional Cold War Army into an army that could lead in the 21st century. And so I set, I set out to get the resources I need, which meant that I spent most of my time walking the halls of the Pentagon, convincing the people in the office of the Secretary of Defense, and, in, and then going over to Congress and talking to them about resources. And, and that that, that's what that's what I did, and I, I actually inherited a budget that, that Pete had put in place that that was two hundred and fifty four billion dollars, a quarter of a trillion dollars. That's two thousand eight's budget. To put it in perspective for you, the budget on September eleventh was seventy eight billion. That's how much that it had grown. That's the good news. The bad news was it was only going in one direction from there. And I, I saw that we were going to be losing money as we needed to, as we needed it to get better. So that was the biggest challenge that I had. And it was a continuous fight for the four years that I was there. See, I would, I would tell you that, you know, what I told you a minute ago about getting called back, I was sitting in my truck and I got called back to Washington to be the Army Chief of Staff, right? And, uh, one thing that we had to do was, uh, now, uh, you got to put this in context. Um, I did not want to do that. And what we did was we made an agreement, Secretary Rumsfeld, President Bush, and I, about what some of the conditions would be. And I was very, very concerned. You might remember that the, the, the Bush administration came in intent on cutting the Army to, to probably the smallest army we were going to see in a long time. They were going to cut two more, to, two more divisions out of it. And this is after the previous administration, the Clinton administration, had already taken the peace dividend from the Cold War, you know, uh, and pushed, pushed all that down um, after the uh, first Desert Shield, Desert Storm stuff. So <clears throat> I told them I needed a little bit of time. And this is a challenge. You know, because there's there's a you know, there's a demand. We have two wars going on. We had a demand for something like 28 brigade combat teams, okay, to cover those two wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, and that doesn't count all of the other brigade size units, artillery, aviation, uh, sustainment, and all the rest of it. And so one of the first things we did was uh, I got agreement from them that they would not cut the army. And I told them that, you know, the two divisions. And the second thing I got from them was four months to decide how big the Army needed to be and how we were going to resource that. And so I went started going around the Army. The simplest part about being chief of staff of the Army is dealing with soldiers, non-commissioned officers and officers. You know, dealing with the Army is not a problem. You know, they listen to you. They, they do the best they can do to... to I mean, you know, the Army follows orders, and it, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a great organization. The Army's embedded inside of a Defense Department that isn't that way. It's very, very difficult. There's a lot of politics involved in it because of the, um, you know, the other competing requirements out there. And there's a lot of issues all the time, you know, about, uh, you know, who likes the war, didn't like the war, and all the rest of this kind of stuff. But nevertheless, uh, you know, my... My deal that I told them was, look, I am not going to be chief staff of the Army and, and send any soldier in harm's way 
that I am not sure that I've done my very best to prepare them to go. That's trained, organized, equipped, and led well. I said, that is, that is a red line for me, and that's what we're going to do. They said, make sense. And so I went back to him in four months, and I said, we need to grow this Army, which was 33 torn apart brigade combat teams in the active force, and 15 even worse torn apart because of all of the, the uh, jumble mumble that's been going on, you know, uh, tearing them apart, sending them here and there on, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I came up and said, we need 82 brigade combat teams. That's what it takes to sustain the force indefinitely in, a, in there. And so I got permission to do that. And we got started banging on Congress and others, and we got a lot of what's called OCO money. In those days, it was called supplemental, but it's, it's not. It's money over and above the budget. You know, I went around. There were 5,000 Humvees, brand new ones, sitting down at Anniston Army Depot without tires on them. We, had, we lost almost 100 helicopters in Iraq and Afghanistan because they didn't have aircraft survivability equipment on them. We had terrible ammo problems. All this is a result of, you know, of people cutting back on the thing. It, you know, I don't want to bore you with all this stuff, okay, but they, these are really big problems, all right? They're big. Uh, we, the first surge we did in Iraq, uh, George, were you, that was the one, um, 2004 surge. For the elections. Yeah, with, uh, with Marty Dempsey was over with the first division. We moved more equipment and people in the high port and crossover on that thing than they moved into England initially for the Normandy invasion. And we did it in six weeks. Okay, I mean, that's how much different. You talk about agility. Talk about, you know, the capabilities and capacities that we have today. So this is, I mean, you know, I'm just not even scratching the paint on this. And so we fought through this whole dadgum thing. And you know, everybody talking about the surge in 2007, we had already done five surges. They just didn't call them surges. Right? For yeah, you. Right. All right. So I go back as a chief, and one of the other deals was I got to pick my vice. A guy by the name of Jack Keene was my vice, and I didn't want him to be my vice. And uh, so we, we retired Jack Keene, and I picked him. And he was the director of the joint staff, and Rumsfeld loved him, and he didn't want to let him go. And I said, you promised me I could pick my vice, and so he gave him to me. And so I got to keep George for about six months, and then they said, we got to put somebody in Iraq. And I said, George Casey's the guy. And his wife still pissed at me because she was just moving <laughs> in the house. And he so, went over there so, for three so years. So you got to hear this st story, yeah. right? So he calls me in his office one day, and he yeah. says, okay, we need some, I need you to put a list together of Army three and four stars that could replace Rick Sanchez in Iraq. And we'd already talked, and we were involved. We just started a long-term uh, long organizational transformation of the Army. Biggest organizational change since World War II. And, and we'd agreed I was going to stay there and help him through that. So I take the list over, and he's got these two big white rocking chairs on the front porch of quarters one, and we're sitting in the rocking chairs, and I give him the list, and he looks at it. And he says, your name's not on this. And I said, I know, I thought we, I was staying here to help you do this. And he said, he just, looked, he just looked at it and nodded, didn't say anything. And I'm sitting in his office two days later, and John Abizade, who's coming out of the White House, calls and said, tells him Casey's going to Iraq. And that was it. And it just so happened that I was actually moving from Fort Myer to Fort McNair into the vice chief of staff's house. And the moving van was pulling away from the house empty just about the time that I was getting the word I was going to Iraq. So I had to go home and find my wife on the third floor unpacking boxes. And I said, I'm an infantryman, you know, I can't, I, this soft stuff didn't quite work with me. So I, as nicely as I could, I said, dear, stop unpacking and sit down, I'm going to Iraq. And she burst into tears. And, and I, I, I kid her, I said to this day, I wasn't sure whether she was crying because I was going to Iraq or she had to stop unpacking. <laughs> But we left him in the house. <laughs> and you talk about courage, because I had to face her. <laughs> she, she was. But we took good care of him. We, yeah, we, left, we left him in the house. But let me, you know, George just said a minute ago about uh, how big that budget was in 2008. You know why it was that big? Because in 2006, when they tried to cut us, 
I said, I will not submit this budget if that's what you're going to cut us. And we held out for over six months. This was not a happy time because what I told them was, you either get rid of me or you pay up. I mean, in the shorthand, that's, that's what it was. And we had some real moments, okay? And I finally went to President Bush and, Pre and Rumf Secretary Rumsfeld uh, came, you know, we agreed. And President Bush made the decision that he was gonna fund that budget because they were gonna cut us pretty close to $40 billion on the thing because of the pressures that was coming down. Uh, but we were in the middle of, this is about the time of the surge, just before the surge. This is, you know, why do we tell you these stories? Because, you know, I'll tell you, I think both of us up here would tell you the most fun we ever had in the Army was doing the things you're fixing to do as you get in the Army. Dealing with soldiers, dealing with non-commissioned officers, training and, and doing all the kinds of things you do and operating at, the, at that level is really uh, a lot of fun. I mean, it really is when you look back on it. Some of, some of it didn't. I mean, nobody likes to, you know, cold rain, you know, at night in the hole. But, but it, is, it is something. This stuff we're talking about here is really, really hard work. I mean, it is very, very difficult because you're dealing in a, in a, at a strategic level with the whole, you know, with the whole of government involved, all pulling in different directions on what's going to happen. And yet you're the chief of staff of the Army, and you're the one that is sending soldiers into harm's way based upon what you can get out of the system to prepare them to go. It's very, very difficult, and it is not a lot of fun on the thing. Uh, gentlemen, if I could uh, interject, uh, one of the – there are many unique parts of this panel. Uh, probably the most significant for the majority of this audience, since the majority ROTC cadets, is the fact that both of you commissioned through ROTC. Is there anything you can relate to us about how your ROTC experiences helped you and prepare you for your career as an Army officer and, and, and through your, your time in the Army? Well, you know, Georgetown's probably a lot different than Wyoming, I'm sure it is. So George, George can talk about his. Um, remember I said the Army ain't like it used to be and it never was? Well, ROTC ain't like it used to be either. Okay, when we went to ROTC, at least when I went to ROTC where I went, it was mandatory. All the way up to 19, what, 66, I guess, 67, something like that. So there were a whole lot of people all smoking around in Army Green out there on the parade field, didn't want to be out there. A lot of them, every male in college for the first two years, right? Freshman and sophomore year. Uh, this was not uh, exactly um, the kind of ex your place and the kind of experience you have. Yet there are, there were people. And by the way, the cadre was rotating in and out of Vietnam about every year. I mean, I, I went through ROTC and probably had at least four people in every position that they had on that on the on the cadre in the thing. It was a place for them to get a break out of Vietnam and get ready to go back to Vietnam. It was, it was just a perch, and uh, so. The personal relationship that I had with some of these people was very, very meaningful. And I'm sure some of you have had exactly the same experience with a cadre that you've got in your programs. Um, and it, it was something, because some of these people were saying, don't go to Vietnam. You know, I'm talking about, so, I'm talking about officers now that had been several times, okay? Um, there was, the, the country was really, uh, torn up over all this. Um, but, but the relationships I had with some of these people were really fantastic. And, and where I don't think the program would compare whatsoever to what, what ROTC is today, at least, at least where I went to school, um, the, the leadership provided by some of the individuals who were involved in this thing were very, very important to me. And I remember them to this day. Uh, one of them, matter of fact, who really convinced me to go through with the whole commissioning deal, ended up going back and getting killed in Vietnam. So, you know, I remember him for sure. So, a yeah. whole different kind of a, of a circumstance. Uh, I personally think 
that, um, you know, that by the time I got through, you know, the basic course and Airborne Ranger School, everything got into the unit, that I was as well prepared as anybody else to, you know, to be a lieutenant without any question. Yeah, I, I think the, the ROTC program today is head and shoulders above the program that we went through. I mean, I mentioned, and it wasn't, it wasn't just, uh, just because of Vietnam, but I mean, I, as I mentioned earlier, we started off with several hundred people in, <coughs> in a battalion, and when I graduated, it was down to less than 100, a sm uh, small company. Um, because as popular support for the war went down, so did the desire of people to come into ROTC. Um, but I think it's head and shoulders uh, today. It's head and shoulders above what it was then, and, and you're in much better shape. Uh, we, what we used to call summer camp, uh, that, that was probably the most meaningful part of ROTC for me, mm -hmm. uh, because it was real. And we had folks that had just back from Vietnam, and, and they're teaching us what it was we needed to survive. And, and that plus the, the basic course and the training we received uh, after, uh, after we got in the Army, I, I agree with Pete, I, I felt as well positioned uh, leaving the basic course as, as anybody that uh, from, from any source of commission. Gentlemen, thank you. I believe we have a question, paddle three. Wagner, third Brigade, uh, Creighton University. Uh, I was wondering if I could ask you were some good traits, uh, some traits of good leaders you saw in the Army? I, I couldn't understand the question. Traits, traits of a good leader. Um, and a, when I was a, a young officer, there was a, was a crusty old colonel, his name was Dandridge Malone, Mike Malone. And he used to talk about four things, courage, commitment, candor, and competence. And, and as a company grade officer and as a field grade officer, those were the four traits that I tried to model myself on. Um, competence. The, the, the best thing you can do when you get to your first unit is to, get, is to learn your job and learn every aspect of your job as quick as you can. And you grab that non-commissioned officer, that senior non-commissioned officer, and you get him to teach you everything there is to know about that job. Because un until you're competent, until you feel that you're competent, you, you won't have the confidence to lead. And it will be apparent. Commitment. That when you raise your right hand, you're committing to something larger than yourself. It's not about you anymore. It's about the United States of America, it's about the United States Army, and it's about everything down to your platoon, the men and women who will rely on you for their lives. So check your personal ego at the door. This is about commitment to something big. Uh, candor. Uh, I like candor, especially at, at, at the young stages of an officer's career. Uh, because it, it's openness. And I can remember going to my first platoon and saying, and we, we had done something and I'd screwed something up and I, and, and I said to my platoon, sorry, well, I screwed that up, I'm gonna tell him. He said, oh, Lieutenant, you can't do that. You can't admit that you made a mistake. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? They all know I made a mistake. And so I went out and said, hey, look, I screwed this up, my fault. This is what we're gonna do, we're gonna fix it and we're gonna move on. I always found that that had a much higher payoff. Because like I said, you're not kidding anybody but yourself if you're not honest about your, your strengths and, and your weaknesses. Uh, and, and lastly, courage. As I said earlier, it, it takes courage to act in the face of uncertainty and risk. And any decision you make will be about the future. <clears throat> and what does Yogi Berra say? God rest his soul. Predictions are hard, especially when you're talking about the future. It, it takes courage to act in the face of that uncertainty. But you have to act if you're gonna succeed. And when you act, you're gonna make mistakes, and it, it's not the mistake that's the, that, that's the problem. The problem is if you don't learn from that mistake, fix it and go on to something else. So courage, commitment, and candor, and competence. Those are the four traits that I, that I, I think are very appropriate for 
your level of leadership. You know, when you get commissioned, that commission is different than any other, uh, you know, non-commissioned officers don't have that commission, enlisted soldiers don't have the commission. There's something different and special about being commissioned, and it has to do with the authority that runs directly to the Commander-in-Chief of the United States of the Armed Forces. You are accountable and responsible as a commissioned officer. Now, if you do what General Casey just talked about here, uh, and, and, you know, those tenets that, that he talked about, I agree with 100%. In fact, you know, the, the Army, Army embraces those. I'm sure you've heard some of them before. But soldiers, if you are what he just said, and you demonstrate to soldiers that you care about them, they really, you know, the old saying about, you know, soldiers don't care what you know as long as they know you care. Soldiers will do anything for you if you are that kind of a, an officer and you, they know you care about them. Non-commissioned officers. Non-commissioned officers run things. Officers don't run things. Biggest mistake I see in the officer corps is they're trying to run stuff. They micromanage. They get in the way. Non-commissioned officers run stuff. Officers command stuff. All right? And one of the things you have to bring as an officer to the deal is context. You've got to be able to tell people what the bigger picture looks like and why you're doing what you're doing and how it fits into the bigger picture. Very, very important, especially for the American soldier to understand that and to know why on that thing. So I look at it, and by the way, as you get more senior and you go up, the same things occur. I've seen people that were wonderful division commanders that couldn't, uh, that, that were flops when they, you know, George, you've seen the same thing, okay? You, you know, I've seen people that were great uh, battalion commanders try to command a brigade the way they commanded a battalion and they failed. Or try to command a division the way they commanded a brigade. It isn't about it being just doing something bigger better it is different and as you get very you know as you get much more senior it, it's exponentially harder in terms of, of the deal but all of it shares this idea that you have a a purpose as a commission officer of you know a, a position that allows you to uh, tell your subordinates what kind of the vision is and to create the direction inside that vision and to provide the energy you know to uh, to go but I'll tell you what, uh, if there's one thing I'll tell you is don't get in the way of a non-commissioned officer who is loyal and doing his job. Uh, even though the old manual up at West Point, uh, you know, of course I didn't go to West Point, so I'm taking this on somebody else's deal, but it said that non-commissioned officers are sly, devious, and cunning and bear considerable watching. <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> but they're good people and they know how to run things and they will be your best. I mean, that's a marriage made in heaven when you've got a great non-commissioned officer and a great young officer together leading soldiers. Uh, it is a thing of beauty, I'm telling you. You know, I'm, I am still in touch with my first platoon sergeant I'm, who's, I am God, godfather to his daughter. I'm still in touch with my first first sergeant who's getting his old 25th ID Vietnam vet who's sent sends me a, a card every Christmas and calls me up and says he's still kicking. And we're still, still in touch with my battalion sergeant major and my brigade sergeant major. And my, my division sergeant major happened to be the, the sergeant major of the Army for Pete and me. And uh, he, he, we're, still in, we're still in touch. But those are the kind of bonds yeah. that you make with your non-commissioned officers. Anybody here from Alabama? University of Alabama? My old first, my first first sergeant's killed, but uh, the one I had when I was a cab troop commander, uh, second second cavalry, a guy by the name of Aubrey Cannon, he lived in Alabama, and he was dad gum crazy over the tide. And I called him uh, the night of the championship football game. I said, Dad gum, I can hear you hollering, roll tide, roll all the way up, up here, you know, on the deal. And he was just so pleased, you know, that, uh, you know, to get that, you know, what, what he just said is true. You know, these things are, are very, very special bonds uh, that you go, you go through. And that's what you really remember, uh, you know, as you look back on your service, is, is those relationships. 
Thank you. Uh, paddle two, please. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Oh. Afternoon, gentlemen. Cadet Sondreger, Utah State University. Uh, my question, I guess, kind of goes in line with uh, something you were saying a moment ago, General Schumacher, but uh, between the two of you, I'd say you've covered about every position an officer in the Army can have. Which positions or which transitions uh, were the most difficult for you and why, and which transitions were the, I don't want to say the, the easiest, but the least uncomfortable for you and why? I'll have a go. Um, probably the, the easiest transition for me was, was to battalion command. And, and, and it's probably because when I came in as a lieutenant and I saw the impact that battalion commanders and their spouses had on the young officers in those battalions, I said to myself, what I really want to be is a great battalion commander that takes care of their folks. And so everything I did from the time that I was a lieutenant was to, be, was to prepare myself to be the best battalion commander that I could be. Uh, and so I, when, I, when they passed me that flag, I was, I was ready to go. And, and people always ask you, what, what was your, what level of command did you enjoy the most? And it was battalion command for me, um, largely because it, you know, you develop leaders two levels down. So, so two levels down for me was lieutenants. And I was able to develop and mold lieutenants uh, from the day they walked into the, into the organization. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed doing that. Um, probably the hardest transition for me was when I walked, uh, I was the director of the joint staff. Um, so this is, in the, uh, the fall of 2003, we had gone into Iraq in, in March of 2003. We were still fighting in Afghanistan. And, and basically, the director of the Joint Staff is like the chief of staff for, for, for the, uh, the, joint, the Joint Staff in Washington. And, and it's, a, it, it's a huge job, and it's, it's constant, especially when you're fighting two wars. And so I'd. I'd when I went from there to be the vice chief of staff of the Army, I didn't have any transition period. I literally got promoted in the morning, went back to my office, turned off my computer, <laughs> and walked, <laughs> walked down the hall into the vice's job. And, you know, the Army was involved heavily in those two wars and, as I said, conducting the largest organizational transformation since World War II. And so it, I was drinking from a fire hose, and I was, and I was just starting to get a handle on it when he sent me to Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting too good at it. <laughs> you know, I, I was very fortunate because, um, the, you know, I got to I, I got to command three different company sized organizations. I got to command a rifle company. I got to command a cavalry troop, and I got to command a uh, special operations company um, size unit. I got the chance to do three battalion size unit, squadron, battalion kind of thing. The thing I'll tell you about it is every time I got to do it again, I got better at it. I could, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, so I would say those transitions became easier, you know, as uh, it went up through there. I think the toughest transition that I've seen, and I, and I probably, would have to admit I had a similar one, is kind of going from commando to commander. And you know, that's, that's kind of uh, you know, the time when you've got to take that rucksack off and you've got to now do the kinds of things that aren't as much fun as what you used to do. Because you know, the, the tendency is to get back down and get involved. Now you still have to set the example, you still have to share the hardships, you still have to do all the things that, that, that you have to do, but but the, the idea of, of backing off and creating an environment for now your subordinates to succeed uh, is, a, is a transition that you have to really think about uh, as you do it. And the higher you go, uh, the more it is. 
I didn't have, believe it or not, you know, a lot of people have asked, uh, did you have a tough transition leaving the Army? I left the Army twice. And it didn't bother me either time, to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, I had a good time. Uh, I didn't have a particularly hard time tra transitioning back into it. Uh, you know, I didn't like where I was working, but, you know, we're, you know, with the, you know, we're in the cow pie there, but the, uh, um, but I think, you know, I don't, I don't think all this stuff's that hard, you know, that, that's, I guess, the thing I would tell you, I, I don't make it too hard. You know, command is command. You can learn the, these things, and you can become competent uh, at the things that you need to co come to. Uh, the thing you need to sharpen and learn and build upon is your understanding of how to lead and influence people, uh, you know, how to, how to create the kind of environments for people to succeed, because that's really what your job is uh, as you go. And uh, I just, uh, I guess my hardest transition was when I had to go to the Pentagon for 11 months and 19 days. That, that was hard. I didn't like that at all. Rats and cockroaches down in the basement. <laughs> well, that was when I was a one star. I was down in the basement there in the Army Ops Center working with General Sullivan. Bad. We have a question, paddle two. Blue hands. Yeah, one, uh, of my, one of my platoon leaders was from the University of Delaware. Was he, sir? I still have a little, yeah. He's a Go good hands. Boy. All right. Um, so my question is about the increasingly widening gap between the military and the civilian population and how much you've seen that over the course of your careers and, and thereafter. And I was wondering if at all it was discussed at your level as um, Army Chief of Staff, so why you think that gap exists and um, what effects it'll have on our military and us as the future leaders of the Army. You understand the question? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I must say that, that I, I don't know that the gap is as big as some people make it out to be. Yes, less than 1% of the country serves. But one of the things that I saw uh, when I took over as the chief was that we were drawing National Guard and Reserve units from all across the country. And every time one of those units deployed, the town turned out. And every time they redeployed, the town turned out. Every time that there was a casualty came home, the town turned out. And what I see what I saw was that that we were touching a lot more of the country than I would have thought with just one percent of the of the men, of, of the population of the United States servant. The second thing I saw is after I left the service, uh, there's over four hundred thousand organizations out there uh, that consider themselves veteran or, or service men and women support organizations. Four hundred thousand. Now, then there's probably only a couple of thousand that, that are touching thousands of, 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 of soldiers and sailors, airmen, and Marines. Um, but there's a lot of little mom and pop organizations out there that take people fly fishing, uh, hunting, skiing. The last, a couple of weekends ago, I was in Vermont, and one of the skiers was running an adaptive ski program for veterans that weekend, and I went out and skied with him and, and spoke with him. So, so there's, there's a lot of support out there uh, across the country for the men and women of the armed forces. And, and I don't know what you see or you feel uh, around your own communities and, and, around, and on your own campuses. But it's probably starker for me because of what I grew up with when I was in your position, which was the country was not only against the war, but had turned against the military. And, and the, the way the population of the United States is today toward the military compared to when I was in college uh, is, is night and day. And, and while they may, they may not understand us uh, and they may not serve themselves, 
uh, the goodwill that is at, and the support that is out there for the men and women of the armed forces is is, uh, is pretty good. What I've found, and I, I uh, you know, I've been retired now since 2007, and I and I was out for two years between 2000 and when I got called back. Um, I had a lot of interface in business, and um, I sat on boards like George does, and you know, teach and all this kind of stuff. And and uh, I don't see a big. I, I'm with you. I, I don't see on the street, you know, out there a a problem. I think that uh, that America loves uh, loves its soldiers and loves the military, and it's not like what we came, you know, the Vietnam kind of a thing. Um, you know, my father, George's father was in the Army. He commanded the 1st Cav Division. My father was uh, 32 years in the Army as an artilleryman, World War II, Korean, Vietnam. My brother retired from the Army as a Surgeon General, and he was a three-star in, two, what, 2012, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my daughter was an MP platoon leader in the 82nd Airborne Division, 504, did 15 months in Iraq as a platoon leader. Uh, her husband's on his fifth tour right now with Special Forces uh, in some undisclosed location doing good stuff. Um, you know, the uh, all, by the way, all ROTC people. And uh, and I've got a, a nephew who's flying 130s. You know, you know, I mean, in our family uh, and the people that we associate with, I mean, military service is real. I mean, it's, in, you know, it's not something that anybody ever questioned. Where I worry about it is at the, at the political class level. I think the, the fact that we're having fewer and fewer people that have served that are, that are sitting in seats in government, in Congress, uh, in the Pentagon, and, and these places is a problem. Uh, it'll continue to be a problem. And it, it, as, as officers and as future leaders, uh, you're gonna really have to work on communicating as we did to get the resources and to do the kinds of things that uh, that we have to do, and and it's also very difficult to explain to some of these people that have never, you know, uh, done some of the stuff that you've got to do when you're in combat. Uh, explain to them, you know, these things just don't happen. They're they're not over in six days. Okay, I mean, you know, that that happened one time over in Israel, uh, but. When you get into these kinds of things, it's a long time getting out. I remember how they were beating me up because we were planning, uh, you know, resourcing a 10-year fight. We always had 10 years ahead of us that we knew how we were going to resource the Army 10 years out. And they, they were so mad at me, suggesting that I was, you know, somehow trying to make this happen, you know. And I explained to them, you know, I, the, I'd be the happiest guy in the world to see us, you know, get, get this over with. But... I can't not plan. I can't not be prepared. I can't, because the lead times are too great. And when you're trying to argue with people that have never done any of this stuff, and they don't understand that this isn't a light switch, you just turn it on and off, you know, that this is, this is hard stuff. Uh, that's where I worry. Uh, and and I, think, uh, I think we've got a problem. Yeah, I'm smiling regard. because one of Pete's famous sayings is trying to talk to these people these civilians that he was talking about is like trying to teach the alphabet to a cow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got counseled about that the other yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> I told the president one time that, that talking to Congress was like talking to my cows, you know. I watched their ears flick and their eyes roll and they didn't see my lips moving. But, and, uh, and they didn't take kindly to all that. But nevertheless, you know, it, it's very frustrating. Um, it is, uh, and not to be, you know, totally disrespectful about it, there are some people that have served. I, one of them, uh, you know, out of, out of, uh, South, uh, out of Georgia, uh, Jim Marshall, who uh, mm -hmm. we went to ranger school together, and he served in Vietnam as a, as a staff sergeant, and, uh, and he ended up as a congressman out of Georgia. He, he ended up getting beat because when the Blue Dog Democrats got beat, uh, you know, that whole class of people left. But but he was very valuable. I used to go to, you know, to Afghanistan and Iraq uh, frequently, but I always went over the holidays and see George and everybody, and I would bring Jim Marshall. And because Jim Marshall would sleep on the ground with me, I'd never worry about if we got into trouble, he knew how to handle himself. and. You know, I mean, we would just take a bedroll and wherever we ended up, we'd, we'd be fine. 
And, uh, but I couldn't do that with uh, some of these other cats, you know. They just didn't even camp out well. You know, it just wasn't good. So. I think you have paddle three. Um, Cadet Elliott from Appalachian State University. Uh, as you've all sort of mentioned a little bit, there seems to be a lot of politics, agendas, and reputations involved when you get up to your position as chief of staff. How do you avoid sort of letting the politics of Washington affect you from accomplishing the mission? Hmm. You could take that one first. Well, first of all, you know, when, when I hear people talk about politics, um, th that, you know, the positions we were in, in the same positions, you, you know, even at the level that you're going, you know, you're swearing an oath to the Constitution of the United States. You're not swearing an oath to any personality. You're swearing an oath to the Constitution of the United States. And part of that is, is that you respect the office of the Commander-in-Chief. And you respect, you know, what the the national, you know, the, the the chain of command. And and I can tell you, I never had trouble doing that. I didn't like sometimes the kind of stuff that they were doing, but but there was no question ever in my mind. And I'm sure George would tell you the same thing, you know, Casey. Um, but anybody that doesn't think politics isn't, you know, rampant in Washington doesn't understand what our system is. It it always has been. It. You know, I mean, how many times did Lincoln fire the generals that were running his war, you know, in the, in the Civil War? What, what, what was going on in the Revolutionary War? I mean, look at the politics that were involved in, in, uh, in World War II, you know, that Marshall had to deal with. And, and the King, if you read those stories about it, you know, what they had to do to deal with Churchill and to, and to convince the Congress this and that. Look at what Franklin Roosevelt had to do to prepare the nation to go to war. He knew we were going to World War II. He knew before Pearl Harbor, two years, that's why he started Lend-Lease. Look at what he had to do to, you know, to get the factories going. That was all politics. And this is the world that you're, that you're entering. And the higher you go, the more that that's going to directly, you're going to have to be attuned to that because you have to work through that stuff. Um, so don't take it as, uh, it's not like you become a prostitute or something because you'll never have to do that. I mean, in fact, if you do, you're not doing your job. But you have to understand that the people that you're working for are totally involved in politics. That's, that's their life. And, uh, they, and they have to bring all this along. And, and you have to live inside that. You know, when we did the surge over there, you know, I was the only chief that disagreed, disagreed with President um, Bush about it. And when we had the big meeting in the tank, he said, Pete, you don't, you don't agree. And I said, no, I don't agree. I didn't agree, but for one big reason, and that is we were going to, they kept saying it's a five brigade surge. But see, they didn't understand it. Five brigades mean that people that were already over there a year, we're going to hold those five brigades for another six months or whatever. And we're going to move another five brigades in there. And then we've got to move five more brigades to backfill the five that we surged. It's 15 brigades. Plus an neighbor. Mm -hmm. Plus the neighbors. Yeah, plus the neighbors. It's not just five brigades, and you just don't turn on a dime. And oh, by the way, all this fight we've been doing with the total army, active guard and reserve, they didn't want to do it with the National Guard and Reserve this time. Politics. They didn't want to have to go back out for the surge and tell them a year in advance that we're going to have to mobilize some more National Guard units to backfill these things. And that's why my daughter did 15 months in Iraq instead of 12. That's why all those guys that have been over and over, George, uh, General Casey had to sit on top of that. And that's why. That's politics, see? Uh, and you have to live with it. You have to deal with it as distasteful sometimes as it is. You, you get to say your piece, but then, you know, it, the, the, uh, the class I teach at University of Denver at the graduate level is called Civil Military Relations in War. And, and I, I do three 20th century case studies. I do Marshall and Roosevelt, Truman and MacArthur, and Johnson and the Joint Chiefs. And then I do two 21st century case studies. I do the decision to go to war in Iraq and the decision to surge in Afghanistan. And it all starts with Marshall. 
and, and Marshall uh, probably had the best view of civil military relations in my, in my, in my own view. Uh, but he said, you need to understand politics, but you don't, you should not be part of it. So you need to understand the political implications uh, that, that you're dealing with. But when it comes time to give advice, you are bound to give military advice. What are the military implications of the policy that you're giving advice on? For example, um, I, I was called on to give military advice to the president on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the implementation of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, we, we knew we were going to have to go, the chiefs all knew we were going to have to go to Congress. And so we were pressing the chairman to get an audience with the president so that we could give him our advice before we went to Congress. You know, a lot of people think that generals get in trouble for speaking their mind. They get in trouble for speaking their mind publicly if they haven't told the president first. And so we got our audience in the Oval Office and it's very interesting. Most of the time, Pete knows when, when you go over there to the White House with the chiefs, uh, you, you go downstairs into the, into the situation room. That's where you do all your business. So we all, we all go over there for our meeting and we troop into the situation room and the people say, no, no, it's in the Oval Office today. Well, the, pres <laughs> the president knows well the intimidation effect of the Oval Office. In fact, President Bush used to joke about it. He get prime ministers in, in the in the chair there in the Oval Office like this, and he'd say, "You're not intimidated, are you, Prime Minister or President Karzai?" And he'd smile and laugh. And, and so as soon as we start walking into the Oval Office, I say, "Uh huh, this is this is the intimidation effect." But it was my responsibility to tell the president the military implications of implementing "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" while we were in our at that time ninth year of war. And, and, and still fighting two wars with over 200,000 soldiers deployed in combat. And so I did. And we, you know, and the way it works, they, they always put the Army guy up first because the Army is the oldest service and you get, you talk first. And I had, I, I had maybe three minutes to make my points. And I probably spent three days sharpening what I was going to say in those three minutes because that's not a time to hem and haw. And I said my piece, the president said, thank you very much. Next, went all the way around the room. And then we went up to Congress and we said the same thing to Congress that we told the president. And it was all fine. But I remember one of the senators, they had, they had I, we were not, the chiefs were not, were not unanimous on that. And I think myself and the Commandant of the Marine Corps said, this is not the time to do this right, you know, right now. And a couple of others said they could, the Navy and the Air Force said they could handle it. And one of the senators said, what should I take from this? What should I take that the chiefs are not in unison on this? And I said, Senator, you should think that's a good thing because you're, it's a very difficult issue and you're getting a variety of different views. But once the president decided, I, I was extremely proud of the way that the, all of the services implemented without a hitch. And that just speaks to, to what a, a, a disciplined force that you're joining. Gentlemen, thank you. Paddle four, please. Uh, gentlemen, I'm Christian Atiyah from Company H2 at West Point. Um, when you're commanding larger size formations and you don't have the everyday interactions with all of your soldiers, what are some keys to inciting behavior or cultural change at the lowest levels in your formation? Well, if I understand the question, are you um, are you asking what is the cultural change? What are Say it key, again, slow. What are some keys to inciting behavior change in larger formations where you don't get to interact with all of your soldiers every day? Sir? Oh, okay, yeah. This is this is where um, yeah, yeah, you know uh, this is where communications are so important, uh, and, and some of these things you have to go over and over and over again, and you've got to rely on your chain of command and all kinds of other other vehicles, you know, to get the word down. But you also need to, uh, you know, battlefield circulation kinds of things where you get out in amongst and you ask the right kinds of questions. That's how I took the 
temperature of the army. I know uh, General Casey did that uh, constantly over there in Iraq to get, get his finger on the pulse uh, and, and, and uh, to, uh, you know, touch, touch people and find out, you know, what, what, what is coming out the other end of the pipe that you, you know, you think everything's great. You know, how, how does it sound when it comes out the other end of the pipe that you've been hollering down? And uh, so you have, to, you have to do that kind of sampling. You also have to have, and this is where your, your command sergeant major, your first sergeants, your senior non-commissioned officers play such a big role because their role is to, if you have good ones and you have the right kind of relationship with them, you get tremendous feedback uh, from, from the non-commissioned officer corps about, uh, about these kinds of uh, things. So you're right, uh, you know, in large organizations, um, it is, uh, is a real challenge, uh, you, you know, to, and, and things don't always happen as fast as you'd like them to happen. But if you, uh, if you exercise that chain of command and you exercise your communications uh, systems and you get the right kind of feedback from the system that, uh, you know, the good relationships will provide you, um, you you'd be surprised, uh, you know, how much you can find out, uh, you know, that's going on. Yeah. George, you... Let me take it up a, a level, and I'll tell you about the, the, the hardest cultural change that, that I had to attack. And it, it, it's, it, it's with the culture of the Army. So I came back from Iraq, and you can imagine they had a U-Haul truck full of briefing books that, that they were, I was supposed to read to get spun up on the Army. And I'm working my way through that. And, and I read a report that says uh, it, it's, it's the Army's annual personnel survey. It comes out every April. And it says that 90% of the men and women in the Army in 2000, April of 2007 would not get behavioral health care because they felt it would harm their career. And I said, wow, that, that's not good. And I kept reading, and a couple of days later, I read a, another report, from, a report from the docs, and it said we should expect uh, 10 to 12% of the, our soldiers to get post-traumatic stress on their first deployment. Uh, 15 to 17 on the second deployment and 17 to 19 on a third deployment. So I start, I look at that and I'm looking at this other report about 90% won't get behavioral health care and I said, wait a minute, we, we got a problem here. If we can't do something to reduce the stigma so we get soldiers to get the care they need to get better, we're going to run out of troops eventually. And so we started a program in the Army. We had a we had a big chain teaching program in the summer of 2007. But, you know, a, a one-time shot isn't enough to change culture. And so we started, we, we, got, we brought in some of the brightest minds in the country, uh, and we put together a program called Comprehensive Soldier Fitness. And as part of that program, we had an, a, what they call the Global Assessment Tool. I think some of you may, I don't know if you've taken that yet or not. But it, basically, it, it gives everybody who takes the test, and it's confidential, a, a, a layout of, of where they stand in the five key areas of fitness, physical, emotional, social, spiritual, and family. So every soldier looked at that and said, okay, I got a long bar, I'm okay, I got a short bar, I need to work on it. What we tried to do was raise mental fitness to the same level as, as physical fitness. And we did all the things that Pete said, we got out, we talked, we went to every level of the chain of command, and, and we worked it, and we worked it, and we worked it. And we started sending sergeants to University of Pennsylvania to be become master resilience trainers. We figured if we had master fitness trainers, they helped us improve the physical uh, profile of the Army, we could do the same thing with uh, master resilience trainers. And this went on for a period, the, the whole time I was there. We started it in 2008, uh, and when I left in 2011, I left in April, and I got that same report the annual personnel survey. And this time, only 50% of the men and women of the Army wouldn't get behavioral health care because they felt it would harm their career. Now you can say that's a 40% reduction, that's pretty good, yeah. But that's still half a million people that won't get care. And the Army kept banging away at it, and banging away at it, and then a couple of years later it was down to about 35%. But that's six years. And that's how long culture cultural change takes in big organizations. By the way, you talk about courage, Frito Fridovich. Yeah. Lieutenant General Frito Fridovich, who was a deputy commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, longtime Special Forces officer, uh, 
stood up and said, I've got a problem. He said, he had a problem. He led the way in this, in this business, set the example, because he felt he had a problem. It was manifesting itself in certain ways. And uh, that was a very, very courageous act on his part. And I would never would have guessed that Frito Fridovich had a problem. Yeah. You know, I knew him very, very well. But, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, especially on these kinds of issues, uh, they're, they're really non-traditional uh, kinds of um, social and, and reality issues that are very, very difficult. You know, a lot of people don't know. I remember testifying one time over on the hill there and told them that, you know, we, we did a bunch of research. You know, World War II, we had the highest desertion rate of any war. Nobody knows that. Everybody thinks World War II and the greatest generation and all that. You ever wonder why people don't talk about, you know, their war experiences? It wasn't a happy time for a lot of people. I mean, we put 11, 12 million people into uniform against their will, sent them away for four years, interrupt their life, three years, whatever it was. And the thing that struck me was over 50% of our casualties were psychiatric or psychological casualties. Over 50% World War II. This isn't new, this stuff. Yeah. But the culture, you know, the culture, I mean, how many of us have walked miles on a broken foot, you know? Right. I mean, you just do it. That, that's what you do. Paddle two, please. My name is uh, Cadet Harf, 8th Brigade, Central Washington University. Um, a cadet up here stole my question that I had earlier, but when we're talking about uh, culture... Don't let that stop you. <laughs> well, all right, I'll, I'll go back to that one then. With all the, the political pressures that you have, and we talk about yesterday, you said that being a general is not a political position. How do you weigh what society wants and what politicians want with what your soldiers need and what the organization needs? But, uh, I just tell you, they'll tell you this at every level. It's the man or woman in the mirror test. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you've got to look yourself in the mirror and say, I did this for the, for the reasons that I thought were right at the time. And, and you make your decisions based on that. And you can't, you know, you'll know. You'll know before anybody else does whether you're making decisions for the wrong reasons or, yeah, so. And that's what I always go back to. In the end, of it, you know, I, I, I work very closely with President Bush. Uh, my, my sense is he sleeps very soundly at night. Who? Because he made, President Bush, oh, George yeah. W. Oh, Bush. Yeah. Because he, he did what he thought was right for the country. Intelligence was wrong. That didn't turn out the way that he had hoped. But he made the decisions to keep the country safe. And it was the best decision he could have, he felt it was the best decision he could have made at the time. In the end of the day, that's, that's what it comes down to. You're never, you're not gonna be right at everything you do. Everything you touch is not gonna turn to gold. In fact, you probably got a 50-50 chance it'll go the other way. But in the end, if you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm proud of what I did because I did it for the right reasons, you'll be okay. You know, I'll go back. We're both, we were both involved in lots of different stuff. And I, I was involved in lots of, of, uh, of things where I wasn't sure uh, that, that you know, I'd come home from, okay? And so I absorbed, you know, the looking in the mirror type of a thing. I absorbed an attitude that when it was time to go off and do these things, I was a dead man walking, okay? Now this is, this is a personal thing. I'm not suggesting everybody out here kind of absorb it, but, or, but, but I want to tell you how I kind of feel about it. Um, you know, and that's the same way I felt. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about here is, is going into the thing with total commitment, not worrying about what's going to happen. Uh, you know, if you took one between the eyes, you take one between the eyes. But you can't worry about that. And the same thing at these senior positions, my view. I mean, let me, let me ask you something. What the hell is a person in the, the chief of staff of the Army or the Joint Chiefs, what the hell is the problem? I mean, what do they think, where are they going next? 
Well, why the hell would anybody be worried about this stuff? You know, you go in there, a dead man walking, and you tell the truth. You look in the mirror, and you tell the truth, and you give your military advice. Your job isn't to reconcile what the people of the United States think about stuff. That's what the politicians do. Your job is to give political advice to the political leadership, which happens to be the commander-in-chief. That's who we're talking about here. And in that hat, he's not political. He's the commander-in-chief. That's what the Constitution says. And so, you know, you go in there and you give the best advice. The day you can't look in the mirror and thread the needle, you got to leave. And I did that on numerous occasions. I put, you know, the old stars used to be on Velcro, right here on the middle of your chest, and I've laid them on the table. Not as a bluff and not, I was ready. And I'm sure, I'm sure George had come to that same kind of a thing. I think everybody worth their salt comes to a point that that's what it is, you know, and you can, you can take me or leave me, but where the hell are you gonna go? I mean, there isn't anything else. Is there? Unless you're gonna be the president or something. And I'm not gonna do that. I can tell you that. <laughs> So, you know, I, I think, you know, when you are, uh, when you're a brand new second lieutenant and you report into your platoon, I don't suggest you go laying your bars on the dad gun field table, okay, because you don't know shit, okay? Uh, you're going to learn a lot, but you still got to stand up for your people. You got to do what's right, and you, and you can look in the mirror and tell that, okay? Uh, you know, and as you get more experience and go up, uh, you know, go up the ranks, uh, these kinds of things. But personal courage, one of the reasons why we've got that, remember the old, you know, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage? That personal courage is a tough one for some people. Quite frankly, I think personal courage is tougher than physical courage yes. in, in, in many circumstances. And you've got to look in the mirror and, and say, you know, I'm, I'm in this all the way for the right reasons. And I'm going to take care of my folks. Uh, but you don't want to run around, you know, uh, threatening to commit Harry Carey every five minutes, you know, because that's, uh, that's not useful. Somebody will let you do it, quite frankly. I, I would if somebody was doing that to me. And I'll just, the, the last class in, in, all, in my MBA, uh, my business school leadership class is always on character. And the same thing when I, pr when I do a presentation to businesses last part is always on character because I feel that's the most important element of a leader good good character and for the MBA students I have them read a short part of Aristotle and Aristotle says moral goodness is a function of habit just like physical fitness is a function of habit you want to ha have be, be strong up front, you do a lot of push-ups. If, if you want to be strong morally, you make, you repeatedly make moral decisions. And, and what I found, and, I, and I, I honestly didn't think of this until I started teaching this class, that, that over the course of my career, I was confronted with one dilemma after another. And at the time, when I was a second lieutenant, these things seemed monumental. Looking back, they were inconsequential. But over time, I got in the habit of doing things for the right reasons. And so when I had to sit down across from the president and tell him that I didn't support what he wanted to do with Don't Ask, Don't Tell at this time, I could do it. But, but if I had got on a slippery slope when I was lieutenant and the captain, I, I probably couldn't have done that or wouldn't have done it. So you, you, you build on this over time. And, and it, I guess the other, the other thing Aristotle says is no one ever acts the right way at the right time with, with the right thing to the right person. And so you're going to slip. Everybody will. But when you slip, you go back and correct it. And then you go forward again. We're all human, Bruce. Uh, paddle one. Gentlemen, Cadet Garcia from the University of Vermont. Just one quick question. Over the course of your careers, how have you seen our enemies change and evolve? And how should a junior leader like a lieutenant have to adapt to overcome and defeat those enemies? Uh, 
I'm having trouble understanding the question. Okay, the, I, I got it. So the question. My, my the, ears are bad. Yeah, I know. It's because you, you won't wear hearing aid like you should. <laughs> <laughs> then I, um, then I the qu question is how the, how the enemies have changed and, and, and how we, we've adapted. I, I mean, you're talking about two guys that, that came in and probably spent 30 years of 40 year careers training to fight a war we never fought, which is defeating the Soviet, the Warsaw Pact in Germany. That, that's all we prepared for. And then we spent the last 10 learning to fight a different kind of war while we're fighting it. But that, that's kind of the bane of the military's existence. And, and you know, Rumsfeld got criticized for this, but you know, you, you don't pick your wars. You go to war with what you have and you have to be agile and adaptive if it doesn't turn out to be the war that you thought it was gonna be. Um, we spent a lot of time, I'm sure you were working on this as you were leaving, but writing the doctrine for the post 9-11 environment. And we went back and forth, is it conventional war? Is it a regular war? What should we be preparing the Army for? I mean, we, we were still talking about this two years into my tenure. Like I said, I'm sure it started under you. And what we finally came down to was it's warfare in the 20th century. It's different. And, and you have to think, act, and fight differently. And, and so we started in about the middle of my tenure adapting the training centers so we could do what we call full spectrum rotations where, where they would have to operate across the full spectrum of conflict. And we, we did the first one shortly before I, down at JRTC, right before I left. But hopefully, I think I believe the Army's continued in that in that direction. You you, you got to train as you fight, as you fight. But it's gonna it's not gonna be fighting other armies as as often as we as we might have thought we would in the past. And, and so, it, it'll all be to me. It'll all be in the training. You know, um, the Cold War was certainly the big deal. When, when both of us served, I I kind of came out of that that business back in the in the uh, 70s and got involved in what what would be called small wars, you know. And the reason I bring this up is because all these different places where we went and fought, some of them nobody ever knew we were fighting, uh, but every one of these places was dangerous because it didn't matter whether somebody was 13 years old or 58 years old. They had an AK-47 and ammunition and grenades and rocket-propelled grenades and all this kind of stuff. They were really dangerous, and they didn't have to be very well trained. And you know, and because they weren't, they didn't have much. You know, we used to have a saying uh, that, you know, uh, when you have a lot of money, you don't have to think very hard. When you don't have all those resources, you have to be really thoughtful, and you really have to be cunning and crafty. And that's kind of the deal that, that I spent most of my time kind of involved in. And some of these people were very, very crafty and they were dangerous, but here's the, here's the difficulty. When we had the Cold War and the Soviet Union and the United States had the ability to, to uh, wipe out the whole planet, all these other kinds of problems were kind of ankle biters. You know, it was like two sumo wrestlers holding onto each other's underpants and kicking these other things away, you know, and so we had all these little peripheral fights. Um, the Soviet Union went away. The United States is standing by itself. Now all of a sudden we've got all these people moving into these vacuums. And you've got more and more going on where tanks and artillery and jet airplanes and aircraft carriers aren't particularly relevant to, to all of this, okay? And more and more of it becomes, I'm not saying they're irrelevant, but because we still have these other emerging kinds of threats. And in fact, we've got a slew of them right now with North Korea, Russia, China, Iran. I mean, there's plenty going on. So you have to have them for deterrence sake. But you can only deter people that have something to lose when you can knock their buildings down, take their oil, you know, take their money and all this kind of stuff. But when you have people who are, uh, you know, kind of in free space on all that kind of stuff, uh, now you've got a different kind of person. And some of these people you just flat have to kill. And we've killed a lot of them, okay, of these kind of bad people. And that's the only thing you can do about it. Now here's the problem. We're now in a world where this technology that's floating around is becoming available to more and more and more people. 
and the technology that's available is more and more and more dangerous. And it really is a thing to worry about if, if some of these, uh, something on the scope of a weapon of mass destruction gets in the hands of some of these people because they will use it and they are not deterrable on the deal. And this is part of the balance that we have to deal with now uh, with the resources that we have. We still have peer competitors that are emerging. We still have all this stuff going on and we've got a a world full of very, very dangerous people that are getting more and more technology. And finally, I would tell you that today, the information component of all of this is perhaps the most powerful of all. And I'm not just talking about cyber, I'm talking about the, the, uh, you know, the psychological aspect of it. Um, there are real reasons uh, to control the characterization of the fights that we get in. One of the big reasons why people have been very, very concerned about not creating, you know, a, a crusades again over all this stuff. Uh, these kinds of things are real issues and that's where, where you have to win it. So I guess where I'm going with all this is this isn't something that just happened last Friday. This has been going on for 30 or 40 years. It's just that at the, at the levels that, you know, uh, especially in our army, it hasn't wanted to deal with this stuff. It hasn't had to deal with this stuff. It had bigger things to deal with. Uh, and it now has to deal with this stuff. And it has to deal with the other stuff too. So the army you're going into here is very, very complicated in terms of what the challenge is and what the threat that we face. All of which, in fact, uh, could be existential. I mean, you know, would, uh, you know, given the right kind. Think, think about some of these super empowered individuals or small groups that have more you know, with, with, with a nuclear weapon as an example, have more destructive power at their disposal than nation states had, some of them, in World War II. Think about that. And no way to deter it. So we just have to, you know, we have to be smarter in how we do this. So I don't know, I kind of, I went on a long time there, but this is a fundamental shift in the way we have to think about what we do. And, um, you know, I, I'll give you one last example. The Chinese, read sometime a paper that was a Phibus translation called Unrestricted Warfare. Unrestricted Warfare, you can get it online. It came out in about 98, I think. And it was written by three colonels in China that were in their war college. And I was commanding SOCOM at the time when we discovered this thing, got it translated. And they describe how they're going to uh, fight us if we, if we go to war with the Chinese. And when I was chief of staff of the Army, and uh, you know, we, we hosted these people, the, um, we hosted our counterparts for the first time from China, and lo and behold, one of the generals that came was one of these colonels that had written this paper, and we got in this conversation. And he says, you know, he says, you're a couple of decades ahead of us in terms of your capability, it's very impressive but your Achilles heel is your ability to connect this stuff. It's that information link, communications. And he says, and oh, by the way, your homeland is part of our tactical battle space. So if we were to get in a dust up with them, not only are they gonna try to disconnect our, our joint force constructs, our, you know, our, our stuff, but they're also gonna be turning the lights off, stopping the money, screwing with the water, t calling people in their homes, uh, because of the, the stuff that they've been doing, uh, you know, the, uh, because of social networking. I mean, social networking has given away the farm. If you're on social networking, you're at huge risk. Tell you that right now, to this kind of thing. And it is, uh, it is a fundamentally different problem that we have today. Gentlemen, thank you. Ta think time America for, uh, ready for it. so I, I don't think you're gonna get any posts on Facebook tonight. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question, uh, paddle three. Gentlemen, uh, Cadet Anderson, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Uh, I know that we'll be facing many leadership challenges um, as brand new lieutenants, uh, even as company commanders. So I was wondering, going back to the direct level of leadership, what was maybe one of the hardest uh, leadership challenges or situation that a soldier may have put you through where you were ethically or morally put in a dilemma? 
I guess, and how you and your enlisted counterpart overcame that situation? Hmm. I had a platoon sergeant that had just come back from Vietnam, the 101st, and he was the best platoon sergeant I had in, in, the, in the company. And he made soldier of the year. And he was an alcoholic. And the last time I saw him, his arms weren't any bigger, uh, hell, his legs weren't any bigger around than this bottle here. He died, killed him. And dealing with that, first of all, getting people convinced that he had a problem was a problem. Because, you know, I was a second lieutenant, and this is a hell of a good platoon sergeant. I loved the guy, but I couldn't get anybody to believe that he had a problem, and he had a problem. I mean, a man was putting vodka in the Nadgum uh, windshield washer thing in the car and had a straw, uh, hose so he could drink it while he was driving. Yeah, he had a problem. Now, the other NCOs, they were dealing with him and beating his butt in the motor pool and all kinds of stuff trying to straighten him out, but that wasn't going to happen. See, it was this culture that, that General Casey was talking about a minute ago and, uh, you know, getting people's attention on that. Uh, I lost my battle getting people to help this guy, and he ended up dying. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here, and I'm, I'm struggling to, to come up with a specific example. Uh, I had a similar challenge with a, with a staff sergeant who came back from Vietnam. He was the best field soldier that I had, best leader I had, but he was an alcoholic. This is in Germany in, in, in the early 70s. As I look back on it now, I say this guy had post-traumatic stress. Oh, but all we looked at was the alcohol problem. And, and he went all the way down through the ranks to, to E2, and we finally had to put him out of the Army. And we didn't, we didn't treat him. But uh, I, I think the thing I'd tell you about people problems is it, it, there's a million people in the Army. The, I used to shudder every day thinking somewhere out there right now, this instant, someone in the Army is doing something really bad. It, it just is. And, and where leaders get in trouble is they take, I don't want to say this exactly right, it, they make it personal that if one of their soldiers does something wrong, it reflects on them. And, and when they think it reflects on them, that's when they do things to cover up or, or to do things that, that aren't necessarily ethical. So I think the thing that I tell you is, you are all going to have soldiers that screw up. Believe me. And when you do, don't let it be personal. It's not a direct reflection on you. What the direct reflection will be is how you react when that happens. And I, and I guess the last thing I'll tell you is, you got to ask the hard questions when something bad happens. Because the hard questions are going to get asked. And the lower they get asked, the better off everybody is. But just resist. You get it all out in the open. You know, it's, I call it the sunshine rule. When something bad happens, you put all the sunlight that you can on it so you, you, you figure it out and you understand exactly what happened. And don't try to hide it and cover it up. Address it head on. And then you can look in the mirror at the end of the day. I've got an alibi. I'd kick myself if I didn't share this story with you because all of you are going to go to the basic course, right? 1969, I report into the basic course, and I'm what's called a snowbird, because, because of my commissioning, I ended up getting there a couple of weeks early. And so I'm now, a couple, two or three of us are lieutenants, brand new, haven't been to the basic course yet, but we're hanging around the basic, the, whatever the company is that they assigned us to there. And we're under the control of a staff sergeant, who's a devious staff sergeant. <laughs> And he says, well, we're going to, we're going to, you guys are going to help me scrounge. This was in the days when there wasn't a lot of resources. And so, you know, we were going around all the supply rooms all over this post and trying to get sponges and mop heads and paper and all this kind of stuff, cleanser, you know, all, all that, you know, what we used to call self-service supply stuff. And we would bring it back to him because then we figured, look, you know, this is for the company, right? until one day he took us down to his garage off post where he had a Sam's Club <laughs> full of this stuff. He'd been doing this to lieutenants for a long time. He was retiring. 
and he was building up his little cash. See, it, see, this could happen to you, okay? And it occurred to me that this probably wasn't right, and so we got somebody to look at it, and, and he retired to a different kind of place than he thought he was going to. But this is the kind of stuff that, you know, you got to, if it doesn't seem right, you know, if there's a little something to it, check into it, because um, your reputation as an officer and your responsibility as an officer, uh, it doesn't matter what size these kind of little problems are. They, they all come down to integrity and come down to, uh, you know, there is no kind of cutoff on what's too small to be a problem on things. And I just thought of that when I was sitting here because that was one of those damn things that I, every once in a while I think back on, how could we be so stupid, you know, <laughs> just to have done that, but we did. Uh, gentlemen, our time is coming to a close. But before we do that, we'd like to offer you an opportunity to provide any closing thoughts or advice or, or comments for our cadets. I'm looking forward to dinner myself. I thank you all. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a, uh, uh, you know, I hope some of this has been useful to you. It's been, it's been a pleasure, um, you know, being here. Surprised some of you hadn't fallen asleep. I used to fall asleep when I came in these damn places, you know, and. Uh, I remember, uh, I remember going down to Quantico one time, the Marine thing. I had to go through the Marine Amphibious Warfare School for a year, and I went down there as a chief because they inducted me in the Hall of Fame down there, and the Marines did, and we were in a big auditorium like this, and all the faculty were sitting down here, and I said, Dad, give I'm looking around. I said, I don't even recognize this auditorium anymore. I don't think I was ever in here sober when I was here, you know. <laughs> and all the faculty down there were going, you know. <laughs> They were, I think they turned my picture backwards in the hallway, you know, before we, before we left. But anyway, it's great being with you, and, and I personally uh, very proud that you've made a, a choice. Uh, unlike an awful lot of people, you've made a choice to serve, and uh, coming from a family, uh, you know, that spent years serving, uh, I'm very proud of you for making that choice, and I wish you all the very, very best, because the nation needs you. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Look, just looking out there and look at all your bright and shining faces here. I feel you, you make two old soldiers feel pretty good. Uh, I'll, I'll close with, with uh, sharing something with you that, that Pete shared with me uh, when I became the chief of staff of the Army. And, and the, first, the first day after we passed the, passed the guide on, I walked into the office. And there's this beautiful hand-carved desk there that was made in 1903. It was over in the War Department. They brought it over to the Chief's office. And for probably the only time in the four years I was there, it was completely empty. It was just the glass top, two empty inboxes. Except right where I sat, right where my chair was, where there was a five-by-eight index card that Pete had left. And the title of the card was Boldness. And as it turned out, it was, it was my favorite quote from Theodore Roosevelt. You probably heard it. It's not the critic that counts. It's not the one who points out how the strong ones stumbled or the, or the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the one who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who often comes up short again and again. And who, if at best in the end, knows the value of high achievement and the great devotions. And who, if at worst, if they fail, at least fail while daring greatly, so their soul will never be counted among those cold and timid ones that know neither victory nor defeat. Dare great things. Your army needs you. Thanks. Gentlemen, um, I know that if there were Marshall Awards when you were in ROTC, I'm sure you would have been part of this audience. Oh. I don't know. So we would like to give you, sir, our, I don't our George think C. So. Marshall Awards <laughs> point. Thank you. For you, sir. Thank you. And also, um, this is our 100th year of Army ROTC. It was established, as you all know, in 1916, so this is our centennial. We weren't there. <laughs> and we'd like to give you our centennial dog tags as Great. well. Great. Thank you. And then um, I'd like to make an announcement, and you all are the first to hear this, and you know, this is great news for us. This year in our 100th year, 
in our centennial, we are establishing a national ROTC Hall of Fame. And I would like to announce to our George C. Marshall cadets that the first two members of our Hall of Fame are standing to my left. So can we please oh, welcome yeah. them to our Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You didn't do anything bad, right? Awesome. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. See you at supper. Take the rest of the day off. Yeah. <laughs>